The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark, chapter 9, beginning at the 38th verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him, because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterwards to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will, be, will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where their worm never dies and their fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be peace with one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord, may the words that come from my mouth be inspired by your Holy Spirit. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good luck. Yes, well, was I right? Yeah. Today's gospel passage is a lot. Now, just imagine that this is your first time in a church today ever, and you've just heard this particular Bible passage read. What would you make of it? The jealousy of the disciples, the millstone around the neck threat from Jesus, the severing off of body parts, talk of hell and fire, at least we don't get any brimstone in this Bible reading, it would be enough to make you run for the hills. But stay with us. When you actually understand where Jesus is coming from and where he's going to and that, in fact, Jesus wants to take us with him, I actually wonder if these verses are exactly what those outside of the church need to hear coming from us, from within the church. At this point in Mark's gospel, Jesus has turned towards Jerusalem to his imminent betrayal and crucifixion. The disciples have experienced the signs of wonders, the teachings and the miracles, but over the last few chapters, we've seen Jesus struggling with the disciples to turn them away from worldly thoughts and towards godly thoughts. The disciples are having great difficulty getting to where Jesus is trying to lead them. Peter tried to protect Jesus from danger and Jesus called him Satan. He said, get behind me, Satan. The disciples argued last week amongst themselves about who was the greatest. And Jesus tried to help them understand that they were called to welcome the vulnerable and the marginalized. In our reading from last week, Jesus held a small child in his arms as a visual example of God's priorities. Today's passage picks up right there. And we actually have no indication from Mark's gospel that the child has left Jesus' embrace. So the child is still with Jesus. 
And I think this whole passage reads very differently when you imagine a small child, likely from an impoverished background, not like the AI-generated image that you've got on the screen where the child looks all pristine and clean, held in Jesus' loving and protective embrace. Who is Jesus trying to protect with these strong words? This image leaves us in no doubt. The kingdom of God that Jesus is ushering in is one where the vulnerable and the marginalized are kept safe, where they are not stepped over or on for personal gain or for an agenda. In this passage, Jesus has some very strong words to say about polarization, religious and power abuse and all the ways that we as the church should be held accountable by our neighbours. To understand the disciples' reaction to what I like to call the rogue exorcist, the guy that's off there doing the work of Jesus without actually getting permission from the disciples, we first need to understand a little bit of the background The first work of power that Jesus does in Mark's gospel is actually an exorcism. And so the disciples were aware that casting out evil spirits was something that Jesus did. It was part of his mission and therefore part of their mission. But if you read a little bit before this passage, you'll see that the disciples have just been confronted by their own unsuccessful attempt to cast out a spirit. A person comes to Jesus and says, I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do so. Jesus goes on to cast out that spirit. But a few verses later, we see the disciples coming and complaining to Jesus about somebody who's using Jesus' name to do successfully what they couldn't do. They assume that because they had this privileged position of relationship with Jesus, that if they couldn't do it, there was something amiss with that person over there. They knew Jesus personally. And that person may not have even met or heard Jesus. How could they legitimately cast out an evil spirit? It's almost like they're accusing this person of identity theft by using Jesus' name. I'm sure they weren't expecting the response that Jesus gave either. Jesus actually gives permission for this person and others to use his name. Now, Jesus isn't condoning identity fraud as we know it today, but he does want his followers to do what he does. And this first section of this very tricky passage is a reminder to us that we do not have exclusive rights to Jesus. We do not have the only right revelation. As amazing as our church here in Rabina is, it might surprise you to know that God is doing amazing things in other Anglican churches. And surprise, surprise, God is doing amazing things in all Christian churches. One of the great problems of our time is the rise of polarization. But that polarization should not exist within the church. Yet more and more I hear criticism of other churches and other church leaders. If you take a stroll down YouTube lane, you'll find there and on other platforms lists and lists of videos that are takedown videos calling out incorrect doctrine, bad theology and errant practices of other leaders or other churches. 
Now, uh, I need to say there are limits, there are boundaries, there are standards and expectations, which I'll actually talk about shortly. But when our first inclination is to sway another's opinion so that they agree that I'm right, then that is a stumbling block. One of the greatest stumbling blocks to those outside the church in forming a relationship with Jesus is the way that Christians talk about other Christians. Right now, I have a number of friends who are church leaders, along with around 5,000 or so other church leaders, are attend- attending a conference in South Africa, uh, South, South, sorry, South Korea, um, at the moment, with the express purpose of championing church unity. The reports are amazing. This is, I wish I was there. I did get invited, but I thought, oh no, I've got other things to do, and I wish I was there now. But I'm glad I'm with you here, of course. And on the Gold Coast, over the last 11 years that I've been here, I've seen an exponential rise in the way that churches are willing to work together and how much better we are talking about each other. More and more, I'm hearing church members and pastors say that God is doing something in the space of church unity that God's not done for a very long time. But oh my, have we got a long way to go. Holding rigidly to a point of view without the grace to recognize or listen to other perspectives is a form of manipulation which is part of the abuse that Jesus is just about to call out. These first early verses of this passage are words of liberation and power. We as believers have freedom to express and use the name of Jesus. That name has power over things that are ungodly and unjust. And we should use Jesus' name as much as we can. It's an amazing part of Mark's gospel. But this gospel isn't just four verses. It gets a lot more complicated in the following nine verses. As Uncle Ben said to Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. And that's what this second part of this passage is all about. We don't live in a world that needs to use millstones these uh, days, um, so I'm not sure you appreciate the size of an average millstone. I reckon this is probably a small to average millstone, but Jesus is talking about a great millstone to hang around your neck and be cast into the ocean. Severing limbs is serious business. I don't believe Jesus is mucking around in the second half of this passage. The word stumbling block comes from the Greek word scandalon, from which we get the word scandal. I came across a translation that replaces the words stumbling blocks and causes to stumble with the words scandalize and scandal. Take a listen to this passage with those replacements and see how it makes you feel. If any of you scandalize one of these little ones who believes in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes scandal, cut it off. It is better for you to enter the life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes scandal, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes scandal, tear it out. Using Jesus' name isn't a do anything you want, say anything you want because it works for me proposition. There are limits, there are responsibilities because our expressions and our actions of our belief in Jesus impact others and if we had carte blanche limitless 
opportunities to just to, to say and do whatever we want, then that not only impacts others, it also impacts our own well-being and our relationship with God. We live in our culture today, a culture that values personal choice and personal freedom, so long as it doesn't impact anyone else. While the message of Jesus is liberation and freedom, it's not a choose-your-own-adventure type of freedom. We are called to community, not individuality. We're called to interdependence and unity, not individuality. And so Jesus' message is counter-cultural. It's supposed to be. We're supposed to impact others. Our freedom ends when it impacts adversely on another's relationship with God. That is scandal. And on a personal Christian level, each one of us should have Christ-imposed boundaries. Without them, we not only risk harming others, but also ourselves. And that is scandal. Today's gospel tells today's Christians that what we do in our lives, the way that we speak and we act and we behave and how we use Jesus' name should always be directing people towards God and bringing us closer at the same time to God. Our influence should reflect the nature of God and not be something of our own creation, not our own agenda, not scandal. If we aren't drawing people to God, if we ourselves are drawing away, then this passage says clearly, stop it, cut it off, sever it. Jesus is using metaphoric language, but it's strong metaphoric language. We need to pay attention to our behavior. And when it comes, our behavior comes in between God and someone else, then that by definition becomes ungodly. I reckon sometimes we just need to get out of our own way so that others can see Jesus more clearly. And I wonder if this is what the world outside of the church and those connecting with the church for the first time really need to hear coming from the church today. We've certainly lost a lot of confidence with our neighbours because of the inaction and the abuse that has occurred over the years within the church and from those who represent the church. So what difference would it make if those outside of the church, those connecting for the church, with, the, with the church for the first time, heard words something like this? We will stand back so that you can step forward and more clearly see Jesus. We really do care for the last, the least, and the lost. And it's not just a catchy phrase. You can see that we care by the way that we use our resources and how we spend our time. We not only talk well of each other, but we are the church next door's biggest cheerleader. We hold ourselves to standards and expectations, not so that we look good and we can be holier than thou, but so that we can ensure the vulnerable and the marginalised are kept safe and have an unhindered access to the grace and mercy and loving embrace of Jesus. We might have opinions, we all do, but we hold them lightly so that we can truly listen to and appreciate where you're coming from. We will not use coercive control. We will not vilify or polarise you if you don't agree with us. We will do everything we can to ensure that you know that you are worthy, that you are worth it, and that you are loved by God. And because of that, you are welcome and you are loved by us. 
we are intentionally ensuring that others never feel small, inferior, or excluded. Rather, we're intentionally trying to help them understand the bigness and the wholeness of God. Are we saying those things? Is this the message that's rising from the church? It sounds pretty brave. But I actually think it sounds a lot like deep care. And it sounds like I think we need to have a good hard look at ourselves and address a few things so that we might be able to speak these words out more readily and clearly. But I pray that we're careful with this precious gift that God gives us of ourselves and each other. I pray that we would be strengthened as we follow Jesus and that we might open a way for others to have that relationship with that same Jesus whose loving embrace protects and nurtures us. So Lord, we repent of those times where we have been so self-focused and so self-righteous that we have been inadvertently and maybe even sometimes intentionally a stumbling block for others. Help us to be aware of the greatness of your love. Help us to be aware of our part to play in sharing what difference that means, not only in our lives, but to the lives of the communities and relationships that we have been gifted access to. Continue to work in us as a church to build bravery and deep care into our lives. Help us to stand out more in our world, Lord, and not blend into the background because we're trying not to offend others. But help us to be radically proactive to show the difference your kingdom can make in our world today. Amen. If you are able, I'd invite you.